Hello everyone, so nice to see you. Um, today we are reading from Stuart Little by E.B. White and the illustrations in this book are by Garth Williams who is one of the premier children's illustrators from yesteryear. Um, and this book is so beautiful and wonderful. And we are reading today chapters three and four. Chapter three is called Washing Up and I will just lead in before I start reading with our first illustration. It looks like Stuart and his brother George are doing some exercises. You see that? Okay, and here we go with washing up. Stuart was an early riser. He was most always the first person up in the morning. He liked the feeling of being the first one and stirring. He enjoyed the quiet rooms with the books standing still in the shelves, the pale light coming in through the windows, and the fresh smell of day. In winter time it would be quite dark when he climbed from his bed made out of the cigarette box, and he sometimes shivered with cold as he stood in his nightgown doing his exercises. Stuart touched his toes ten times every morning to keep himself in good condition. He had seen his brother George do it, and George had explained that it kept the stomach muscles firm, and it was a fine ab abdominal thing to do. After exercising, Stuart would slip on his handsome wool wrapper, tie the cord tightly around his waist, and start for the bathroom. Creeping silently through the long, dark hall past his mother's and father's room, past the hall closet where the carpet sweeper was pat, past George's room, and along by the head of the stairs till he got to the bathroom. Of course, the bathroom would be dark too, but Stuart's father had thoughtfully tied a long string to the pull chain of the light. The string reached clear to the floor. By grasping it as high as he could and throwing his whole weight on it, Stuart was able to turn on the light. You can see him here turning on the light. Swinging on the string this way with his long bathrobe trailing around his ankles, he looked like a little old friar pulling the bell rope in an abbey. In an abbey. To get to the wash basin, Stuart had to climb a tiny rope ladder which his father had fixed for him. George had promised to build Stuart a small special wash basin, only one inch high, and with a little rubber tube through from which water would flow. But George was always saying he was going to build something and then forgetting about it. Stuart just went ahead and climbed the rope ladder to the family wash basin every morning to wash his face and hands and brush his teeth. Mrs. Little had provided him with a doll-sized toothbrush, a doll-sized cake of soap, a doll-sized washcloth, and a doll's comb, which he used for combing his whiskers. He carried these things into the, in his bathrobe pocket, and when he reached the top of the ladder, he took them out, laid them neatly in a row, and set about the task of turning the water on. For such a small fellow, turning the water on was quite a problem. He had discussed it with his father one day after making several unsuccessful attempts. I can get up onto the faucet all right, he explained, but I can't seem to turn it on because I have nothing to brace my feet against. Yes, I know, his father replied. That's the whole trouble. George, who always listened to conversations whenever he could, said that in his opinion, they ought to construct a brace for Stuart. And with that, he got out some boards, a saw, a hammer, a screwdriver, a broad awl, and some nails and started to make a terrific fuss in the bathroom, building what he said was going to be a brace for Stuart. But he soon became interested in something else and disappeared, leaving the tools lying all around the bathroom floor. Stuart, after examining this mess, turned to his father again. Maybe I could pound the faucet with something and turn it on that way, he said. So Stuart's father provided him with a very small light hammer made of wood, and Stuart found that by swinging it three times around his head and letting it come down with a crash against the handle of the faucet, he could start a thin stream of water flowing, enough to brush his teeth in anyway and moisten his washcloth. So every morning after climbing to the basin, he would seize his hammer and pound the faucet. And the other members of the household, dozing in their beds, would hear the bright, sharp blink, blink, blink of Stuart's hammer, like a faraway blacksmith, telling them the day had come and Stuart was trying to brush his teeth. And there's Stuart going for it. Pretty mighty. And this is chapter four, and that's called Exercise. One fine morning in the month of May, when Stuart was three years old, he arose early as was his custom, washed, dressed himself, took his hat and cane, and went downstairs into the living room to see what everyone was doing. Nobody was around but Snowbell, the white cat belonging to Mrs. Little. Snowbell was another early riser, and this morning he was lying on the rug in the middle of the room, thinking about the days when he was just a kitten. Good morning, said Stuart. Hello, replied Snowball sharply. You're up early, aren't you? Stuart looked at his watch. 
Yes, he says. It's only five minutes past six, but I felt good and I thought I'd come down and get a little exercise. I should think you get all the exercise you want up there in the bathroom, banging around, waking up the rest of us, trying to get that water started so you can brush your teeth. Your teeth aren't so big enough to brush anyway. You want to see a good set? Look at mine. Snowball opened his mouth and showed two rows of gleaming white teeth, sharp as needles. Very nice, said Stuart, but mine are all right too, even though they're small. As for exercise, I take all I can get. I bet my stomach muscles are firmer than yours. I bet they're not, said the cat. I bet they are, said Stuart. They're like iron bands. I bet they're not, said the cat. Stuart glanced around the room to see what he could do to prove Snowbell what to prove to Snowbell what a good what good stomach muscles he had. He spied the drawn window shade on the east window and its shade and cord and ring like a trapeze, and it gave him an idea. Climbing to the windowsill, he took off his cat and lay down his cap and lay down his cane. You can't do this, he said to the cat, and he ran and jumped onto the ring the way acrobats do in a circus, meaning to pull himself up. And here you can see Stuart doing just that. A surprising thing happened. Stuart had taken such a hard jump that it started it started the shade with a loud snap. The shade flew up clear to the top of the window, dragging Stuart along with it and rolling him up beside so he couldn't budge. Holy mackerel, said Snowbell, who was almost as surprised as Stuart Little. I guess that will teach him to show off his muscles. Help! Let me out! cried Stuart, who was frightened and bruised inside the rolled up shade and who could barely breathe. But his voice was so weak that nobody heard. Snowbell just chuckled. He was not fond of Stuart, and it didn't bother him at all that Stuart was all wrapped up in a window shade, crying and hurt and unable to get out. Instead of running upstairs and telling Mr. and Mrs. Little about the accident, Snowbell did a very curious thing. He glanced around to see if anybody was looking. Then he leapt softly to the windowsill, picked up Stuart's hat and cane in his mouth, and carried them to the pantry and laid them at the entrance to the mouse hole. When Mrs. Little came down later and found them there, she gave a shrill scream, ah! which brought everybody on the run. It's happened, she cried. What has? asked her husband. Stuart's down the mouse hole! And that is the end of the chapter, but I do have a little picture of Snowbell up to no good. And the next chapter, chapter five, is called Rescued, and we'll, you will hear that one tomorrow. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you then. Bye.